Father, may we do no damage to the word, but preach that which become of sound doctrine and gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. This powerful text, which denies the possibility of theistic evolution, that is the soul being breathed into a living animal form, God breathed into Adam the breath of life. He didn't breathe the breath of life into dogs and cats. You know, there are people, I hear people now say that their dogs, their puppies, their animals are their children. And they will tell you in, in casual conversation and mean no harm. You know, these are our family members. Dogs aren't people. Cats aren't people. That is inordinate affection. You love a puppy uh, like a human being loves their offspring. Um, there's something wrong with that. Amen. Amen. Uh, um, animals aren't people. The left tries to refer to humans as the human animals. No, they're two different categories. Just like reptiles and animals, there are humans and animals. We're humans. The pet may be precious, but the pet is not a human being. Amen. This text denies the possibility of theistic evolution as well as any other form of evolution. You don't see where Adam evolved from some uh, amoeba. And you certainly doesn't see in the text where Adam uh, evolved from a chimpanzee or a monkey or any primate. No, God made man. He formed the man, uh, the human and then breathed into man's nostrils. And uh, the text states that after God breathed into Adam's nostrils, as a result of God breathing the breath of life into him, that Adam came alive. Man became a living so, let that sink in for a minute. He was a mannequin until God breathed into him the breath of life. He was a dummy until God breathed into him the breath of life. And when God breathed the breath of life into Adam, Man became a living, he became a living soul. What a powerful passage. With all of the power that's in this passage, and I have not began to exegete it, America's most prolific serial killer used this passage to justify his murderous actions. October 5th, 2015, live action news. In a phone interview with a writer, with writer and director David Altroge of 3801 Lancaster, American Tragedy, infamous Philadelphia abortionist Kermit Gosnell talked about how reading the entire Bible in prison rather than a share a repentant conversion story that one might expect from such an experience because if you hear someone say while I'm incarcerated while incarcerated I read the entire Bible what you expect to hear him say is I got saved instead Gosnell surprised 
Aldrich with quite the opposite sentiment. This is a direct quote. He said, my youngest son asked me, Dad, did you do those things, those horrible things that are in the newspaper? I said, Alex, I don't want to lie to you. I really have to do a lot of reading to feel comfortable that I, in fact, was on solid ground in my thoughts and my approaches. I had to do a lot of reading to make sure I was right with all of those abortions that I performed. And he said this, and until I really completed my first Genesis through Revelation reading of the Bible, which I did since I was incarcerated, I really didn't feel as comfortable as I am. So he says, since I read the Bible, I feel better about what I did. He says, Genesis begins almost, I think it's Genesis 2 and 7. Expresses that breath of life, expresses the breath of life as the beginning of life. That God breathed breath and breathed life into Adam. The Bible, to me, is very clear that life does not happen until breath. So after reading our text, Gosnell felt better about the approximately 128,000 abortions that he performed from 1979 to 2010. But what Gosnell seems to not understand or realize or perhaps cleverly and conveniently dismissed and overlooked is that Adam was never in the womb. Number one. And uh, while I'm preaching this today, I say this often, and it bears being said. If there's someone in the audience who have had an abortion and you've repented of your sins, the Lord has forgiven you. You have no reason to feel uncomfortable. Whatever you do, don't get up and walk out. We're not talking to you nor at you. All of us have been saved from sin. All of us have been forgiven for something. All of us have been washed in the blood of the Lamb who are washed. But you have to allow us to say what needs to be said to try and save the next child. You have to, you have to be mature enough to allow for that. Amen. And if there's uh, and unless there's someone who have stood up and testified and, and shared their personal business, I don't know that there's anyone here who has. So I'm not aiming this at any one. We're just fighting the good fight of faith. Amen? Um, Adam was never in the womb. And life outside the womb requires breath. Life in the womb doesn't require breathing. Once you're born, you have to breathe to live. But babies in the womb don't breathe. The mothers do that for them. The function of the lungs is not the measure of life. I would ask Gosnell, what about the heart? Gosnell knew better. 
What role, I would ask him if I could talk to him, does development and formation play? Or cell activity? If I could talk to him, I'd say if it starts with breath, then explain to me the changes that takes place in the mother's body. For instance, lactation. After she becomes pregnant, at a certain point, her breasts automatically begin to develop milk. It's not for her. Hormonal changes takes place. There's a queasiness in the stomach, a different feel because there's someone there. Oh yeah. The vascular system of the mother changes because now the heart has to pump more blood because there's someone else there. Hip structure changes because somebody's coming. Skin changes take place. Complexion sometimes brighten up for some, and then some women, the next get dark. And sometimes you get all of the above. And the child hadn't breathed outside the womb, yeah. I would ask him if life doesn't begin till breath, then what do you call the force that causes trimesters? Is it death that causes trimesters? Is the activity going on in the mother in activity? The child hadn't breathed yet. And yet all of these things are going on. I would love to ask him if life begins with breath, then what was it that you aborted? To abort by definition is to fail to complete or fail to develop. Doctor, fail to complete or develop what? Or whom? I would ask. If there is no life prior to breathing, then what is it in the womb? Just questions I have. And what are you stopping? And what is the purpose of the procedure in the first place? If there's no life there, what does it mean to be pregnant? If there is no life there, oh, what were those thousands of women carrying on the inside of them? Pregnant by definition means having offspring developing in the uterus. Conceived with a young child. The truth is, Kermit Gosnell's sin caused his conscience to be seared with a hot iron. And if Gosnell, I won't call him Brother Gosnell because he's not my brother. If Gosnell read the entire Bible, as he claims, then surely he had to have read Psalms 139. What David plainly writes about what takes place in the womb of the mother before the child takes a breath on the outside of her mother. Psalms 139 not only tells us what goes on in the womb of the mother before breathing, but it tells us what goes on in heaven before that child takes a breath. Psalms 139 
uh, says in uh, verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully, that is awesomely and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. He says, my substance, my strength, was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Made in secret, curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth is a reference to his mother's womb. He says, my eyes, thine eyes, speaking of God, did see my substance. So now the Lord sees the person in the womb. Yet being unperfect, yet being undeveloped, in thy book, all my members were written. Even before I was born, Amen. while I'm forming in the womb, in heaven you're writing my day. In, in God's book. Writing, you know what he's doing? He's writing my script. Thank God my mama uh, gave birth to me because standing here today was in the script while I was being formed in her womb. Can I get a witness? He says, all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned. My memories, my, my uh, days were written. Amen. And then what days I should be um, placed on this earth and fashioned and how long it should take. All of these things, God wrote, wrote it down. And he did this when as yet there was none of them. That even That is, before I was completely formed, God wrote this down. See, those of us who are in the battle for life, we fight for God's plan. We fight for God's will to be done. Amen. Well, we fight for other things also, preacher. There are other things that are important. It's true. There are other things. It's true. But none of the other things apply if you don't get to be born. So that's the issue with this. If you don't get born, nothing else matters. All those big, strong football players in the NFL had to first be born. The doctors, the lawyers, the entertainers, drug dealers, rappers, teachers, preachers, you name it. There, there are no government programs that aid and assist those who don't get to be born. You can't live out God's plan for your life if you don't get to be born. Amen. Verse 17 says, how precious also are thy thoughts, that is, your plans unto me. O oh God, how great the sum of them. David said, even the things that you plan for me, how precious are they. And the, the bigness of them. All of this probably <laughs> in the first trimester. The Lord records these things. I would love to talk to Kermit Gosnell and say, surely you read this. Amen. And all of this takes place prior to breathing outside of the womb. Then for a little non-scriptural or extra-biblical warfare, I would ask him if he remembers the original Hippocratic Oath concerning this issue. It says, I will make no, I will give no sort of medicine to any pregnant woman with a view to destroy the child. 
Oh, what has happened to doctors? What has happened to the medical community? They have no hesitations now in giving medicines, if you will call it that, to mothers who tell them I'm there to end the life of my child. Are you praying for me today? Our text says that God breathed into his nostrils. Breathed. Breathed comes from a Hebrew word that literally means to, to puff. God, to inflate, to blow. Once he finished, into Adam. God breathed. And what did he into him? The Bible says he the breath of life, which comes from a Hebrew word that means divine uh, inspiration. It means intellect. It means soul. It means spirit. God into Adam. Divine inspiration. Intellect. And, and this is amazing when you think about it because it shows that after God had made the planet conducive for human life, if you study Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 through 25, he, he restores the planet. See, Genesis 1 and 1 describes a perfect world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything was complete. But in verse 2, Theologians calls it Satan's flood. Uh, something happened. It says the earth became void. The, the word was comes from a, a Hebrew word that literally means to become. Verse 2 says and the earth was void. It became void. Uh, some argue that a, uh, possibly a meteorite hit it. But something cataclysmic happened uh, to the planet and there's uh, ample um, archaeological evidence that shows that the, the dinosaurs and the people and the life that took place during uh, that age, they didn't die off slowly. Something cataclysmic took place. There was a sudden uh, cutoff and they died. Their lives was taken. It says, and the earth was without form and void. Without form and void certainly doesn't describe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It, was, it became marred without form and it was void. It was empty. But thank God that he didn't give up on the planet. He says, um, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, uh, if darkness was upon the face of the deep, and, uh, and there's no light. If there's no light, there's no heat. And there's ample evidence that this earth at one time was, there was an ice age. And you can look at the Grand Canyon in verses, various places, and you can see that those beautiful mountainous formations were at one time covered with water. The earth, now we see it dark and covered with water. It's, it's cold. The animals are gone. Life is gone. Heat is gone. Darkness is everywhere. But thank God that the Holy Ghost hung around. The Bible said the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And at some point, we're not told at what point, but at some point, God said, let there be light. And when God spoke it, the heavens, everything lit up. Now, he did not create the sun right here. But we'll read a little later when you studied at home where he made the sun and gave the sun to be the greater light to guide the day and the moon to be the lesser light to guide the night. It was God's power. At the power of his word, he said, let there be light. And there was light. Praise the Lord. Global warming.
All of a sudden, the ice caps started melting. Amen. And God saw the light and saw that it was good and divided the light from the darkness. And, uh, and as you read, you will see where the Lord calls powerful things to happen. He said, let the dry land appear. You talking about, can you imagine the energy and the power that, that it took, the, the volcanic uh, activity that it took to cause the dry land that was underneath all of the water to rise above the waters. Glory to God. Only a mighty God could do such a thing. And, uh, and he, he takes the planet and, oh, he does so many wonderful things. He provides food, water, sunlight, grass, cattle, fowl, fish. Amen. Dry land, moonlight, the expansion. He does everything, everything. He puts everything in the earth that would make it possible to make a smartphone, to build an internet, to build airplanes, to build skyscrapers, communities, carpets, clothing, supermarkets. Just took us a while to figure out how to use the things. Medicines, you name it, everything. Man creates nothing. Everything that we make, we make it from the material that God put here in the first place. After God did all of these things, Day one through five. On the sixth day, God said, after everything was right, God said, let us make man. Isn't that powerful? Let us make man in our own image. After our likeness. And, uh, and not only that, but let them, mankind, the human race, not the black race, not the white race, the human race, not the Asian race or the Hispanic race, the human race. He said, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so God created man in his own image. This is going to come as a surprise to some of you. And in the image of God created he him. Male and female. Created he them. That's it. There ain't no third sex. Male and female. Created he them. Now we know that in creation... That was only six days. Because on the seventh day, according to Genesis 2, 1 through 2, God rested. Am I preaching? Matter of fact, Genesis 2 and 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and rested on the seventh day. So then there is no eighth day of creation. It was over. Am I, am I right? But we find in our text, our text zooms in and gives us a closer look on the sixth uh, day of creation since God rested on the seventh. And it was on the sixth that he says, I'm going to make, let us make man. So we zoom in and we find, uh, when we look at the broad view, it tells us God made man in his own image. Amen, am I right? on the sixth day. But when we zoom in, we see that God made form man from the dust of the earth. It tells us a little more. It says he formed, that is, he squeezed man 
He molded man uh, like a potter would make a vessel. He, he framed man. Yeah, he did. Uh, from the word form, it gives us the impression that God was the first technician. And what a technician he had to be to make the human body. Think about that. Say that God made man. The word man here, Adam. Adam uh, literally means mankind, and Adam is a proper noun. As he zooms in, he's using the proper noun for the man, Adam. God made Adam. Praise the Lord. Uh, and, and, and notice this. He didn't make him from mud. He didn't make him from clay. He didn't make him uh, from rich soil. The Bible said that God made man of the dust of the ground. Dust, fine particles of earth. Let me tell you something. The workmanship exceeded the material. Because we were not made of gold dust. We were not made of powder of pearl. We were not made, praise the Lord, of diamond dust. But we were made of common dust. Dust of the ground. Plenty of it. Nothing particularly uh, peculiar about it. Nothing... Uh, just dust. Are you with me? Ordinary, plain old dust. Stomp the ground anywhere, it comes up. Dust. Not earth, but dust of the earth. Dust, the powdery earth or, or matter in bits fine enough to easily be suspended in the air. That's what he made us from. See, uh, Psalm 103 and 14 says, uh, For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. Thank you, Lord. We must never forget our dustness. See, when we get, forget our dustness, we get, we get beside ourselves. We think that we're more than who and what we are. Praise the Lord, we are dust. This would be a fine time to ask you to speak to your neighbor and look at your neighbor and say, hello, hello. dust. <laughs> Don't forget your dustiness. Amen. And let me tell you something, our dustness, see, man, when God made man, God raised man from the dust. When man disobeyed God, man returned to dust. For in Adam's fallen state, God said, dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. Yes, everybody shout dust. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He breathed divine inspiration he breathed intellect. What is the point that I'm trying to make? The point is after God made the earth conducive for human life, God said, now I can't put someone in charge of this complex planet, in this complex system who knows nothing. So if I'm going to give man dominion and uh, if I'm going to uh, uh, let him rule over the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, cattle of the field, if I expect him to subdue the earth, to know how to move mountains, make roads, build hospitals, communities, shopping centers and churches, schools, and the like, then he's got to know something. So why did uh, the knowledge 
come from. For we know that Adam was filled with knowledge. Oh, we know Adam was smart because the Bible says in Genesis 2 and 19, and out of the ground the Lord God formed uh, every beast of the field. Now he made them out the ground, made man from dust. They formed every beast of the field, fowl of the, of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now the question is, where did Adam get such a vocabulary? Where did Adam get such intelligence? Where did Adam get that sense? I'll tell you where it came from. It came from God breathed into him. Intellect. God breathed into him intelligence. And see, God didn't want man to just exist, but it was the will of God that man be intelligent. He didn't just give him existence, he gave him intelligence. Somebody shout something today. When God breathed into Adam, God gave Adam the ability to observe and the ability to reason. Bible says in Genesis 2 and 20, and, and Adam gave names to all the cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field, but for Adam, that was not found a help meet for him. God knew that as Adam named all of these, that he would also notice because of that there was nobody like him. And my reasoning and deducting, Adam said, uh, I'm, I'm, there's a whole lot of uh, people, there's a whole lot of things going on here, but ain't nobody like me. See, he had to notice. See, it, it takes a while for a child to notice things about themselves. Parents know that as they discover parts of their bodies, praise the Lord, it, uh, the child is fascinated with himself. And uh, Adam began to notice, he noticed as soon as he uh, uh, named animals that there was nobody like him. That's because God gives men the ability to reason and to observe. There's no reason for us to be boneheaded. There's no reason for us to be stupid. There's no reason for us to keep bumping our heads against the wall. God breathed into us the breath of life. The breath of life gave Adam the know-how to be a business owner and a hard worker. Genesis 2 and 15 says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to dress it and to keep it. You don't read anywhere where God taught him how to dress it. You don't read where the Lord said, Now here's how you use a hoe. And here's how you drive the tractor. No, God <laughs> breathed it into him. And he knew that Adam automatically knew what to do. Can I get a witness? I'm almost done. It says the breath of life, uh, the breath of life uh, gave Adam understanding. Gave him the understanding, my brothers, how to love his wife and how to raise his family. I guess God hadn't breathed on some of us. The Bible says, and Adam, and Adam said when God brought Eve to him, he brought Eve and he didn't bring a Playboy magazine. He brought Eve and he didn't bring pornography. He brought Eve and he didn't bring a manual. He just brought her. And Adam looked at her and said, Now this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken from the man. And then I heard Moses say, and therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they too shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife. And not Adam and Steve, not Adam and Jack, not Adam and John, but Adam and his wife. Oh Lord. Someone
one said the other day that if you say Adam and uh, Eve and not Adam and Steve, that you're being uncaring, unloving, and that's not a Christ-centered church. I, I don't have but one response. The Bible said Adam and Eve. Now you may be wiser than the Bible, but I'm not going to let any puny human being talk me into disobeying God or into ignoring scripture. The most loving thing you can do is tell people the truth. I don't understand this new definition of love. This new definition of love is that you just tell half the story. This new definition of love is that you don't call a spade a spade. This new definition of love is that you don't cry loud and spam out like the prophet Isaiah said. But God did make Eve for Adam. And God did make Adam for Eve. Let me hear you say, yeah! Yes, Lord. And uh, since when has preaching the Bible been a mean thing? Since when has preaching the Bible with power and authority been a me uh, considered a mean thing? Do you know the word preach is, uh, even when you study that word, it is to, you got to project. The, the, to preach the gospel it is the herald standing on the side of the street screaming extra extra read all about it then I heard God said how can they hear without a preacher and how can he preach except they be sent now I don't know about them demons on your side of town but the demons on my side of town we gotta preach the gospel to them we gotta cast them out we gotta say what God said and we can't apologize for it somebody stand up and shout something to Jesus and tell God thank you hallelujah they were both naked the man and his wife and they were not ashamed now that's Genesis 2 23 through 25 but if you go into chapter 4 you'll also see it says and Adam knew Eve he knew what to do knew Eve and she conceived and bare Cain and said I've gotten a, a man from the Lord and then it says she conceived again in other words she had twin boys he knew from the how to start a family how to treat his wife brothers you got to treat your wives right got to treat our families right got to do what God have called us to do. You can't ignore the home. I can't get any help in here. I really, I, you know, it's, it's not said enough, but abortion is a man's problem as well as it is a woman's problem. 81% of the time, if the man would just take care of the baby, she'd have the baby. I remember one day we heard something at Drake Circle that broke our hearts and challenge our manhood at the same time. We heard something that made us want to cry and it made us want to fight. It made us want to hug and it made us want to suplex. It made us want to comfort and it made us want to power drive. At the same time, we wanted to be comforting and to be a MMA, MMA fighter at the same time because we were in the back getting ready to drive off and a young sister came out of the clinic she walked out of there and she said to her boyfriend I've decided to keep my baby when we heard her we got so happy but then when we heard him it made us want to Oh, Lord, get busy doing what God saved us from doing. Hallelujah. I thought he had taken the fight out until I heard that man. He began to cuss at her, swear at her. Am I right about it, brethren? And then we heard him strike her. But thank God she got struck, but she didn't go back in. We couldn't do anything 
because it was on their property. But I tell you one thing, had we been allowed to, we would have got that ninja that day. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. Yeah! Yeah, Lord! Somebody lift your hands and give God praise. Oh, oh Lord, we need to stop and ask God to breathe on me. I heard Jesus when he looked at his disciples in John's Gospel, chapter 20 and verse 22. It said, and he said, and when he had said this, that he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. I wonder this morning will somebody lift their hands and say, Lord, 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 breathe on me. Breathe. Breathe on me, Jesus. If you breathe on me, I can live right. If you breathe on me, I can overcome the devil. If you breathe on me, I can make a difference. Wow! Oh, Lord! If you breathe on me, we'll have success at the Franklin Street Abortion Clinic. If you breathe on me, we'll be able to stand and cry loud and spare not. If you breathe on me, the Bible said in Acts 7, 17, 17 and 25, it says, neither is worshiped by men's hands. Talking about the Lord, as though he needeth, needs something from them, seeing, but he giveth life to all and breath and all things. You see, our God is the life giver. Ezekiel said, then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, oh, breathe, and breathe on these that they may live. Somebody, you've been going through the devil has been trying to beat you down. But today is your day. Because as I preach, the Lord is breathing on this place. As I preach, the power of God is being released in here. And if you believe God, just throw your hands up. Throw your head back and call on him like you want him. Call on him, but use your preaching voice. Say, Lord, oh, oh, Lord, breathe on me. Breathe on my heart. Breathe on my mind. Breathe on my family. Lord, breath of life. Lord, breathe the Holy Spirit. Lord, 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 breathe on me. Breathe on me. Breathe on me. saints. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tremina, he's breathing on your situation. Brother, he's breathing 
on your situation. Somebody's bereaved. He's breathing on your family. Somebody's sick. He's breathing on your body. Somebody's troubled. He's breathing on your mind. Ah, I feel my hip coming here. Ah, help. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. Have your way, Lord. Yeah. wonder if we let God breathe on us. If I had Proverbs 4 and 23 says, keep your heart with all diligence for from them come the issues of life. Well, there is no issue that God can't breathe on. There is no issue that God can't handle whatever the devil does. He's able to see us through. And in my clothes today, speaking of breathing, I heard David shift. He went from God's breath to ours. And David said, Lord every, Lord every, Lord everything that had breath, Praise the Lord! If God has given you breath, give him praise. 